I would like to, well, introduce, not just to say some words before Simon Singh starts uh, the presentation. Um, Simon is, uh, has a PhD in uh, nuclear physics or particle. particle physics, yes. And uh, uh, after the PhD, he uh, started working for different uh, media for BBC, for example, was a, d a director and producer of several, several programs. And he is well known for uh, several of his books. Uh, uh, three of them, or now four of them, are translated to, there are four books. Okay, so not more, but all yeah. four books are translated to Hungarian. Yes, uh, one is the code book, the other is Big Bang and uh, uh, Fermat's Last CRM, and now for two years already available in Hungary as well, uh, the Tricor Treatment, um, uh, which uh, I, would, I would love if you would explain uh, what the title means, uh, because I try to find it and I think it's interesting. It's, it, they were not able to translate it to Hungarian, which is not a surprise, and I think they didn't do it for for other languages as well, but I think it would be culturally interesting. Why uh, do you have this title? So now uh, um, Simon will speak about the book and uh, what happened after that related to the book, which is at least as interesting as the book itself. Correct. So this is Simon here. You are tomorrow. Great. So I just checking the sound is working. That's great. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, uh, and what I'm going to talk about is, I'll talk a little bit about the book, uh, Trick or Treatment. And the title it, it, um, comes from uh, an American expression, trick or treat. So on Halloween, the children come, and if you're nice to them, um, if you give them a treat, that's fine. But if you don't give them a treat, then they will trick you. They'll play a, um, a prank on you. So trick or treat became trick or treatment. Um, and uh, you're right, it's been hard to translate. I think, I think the Swedes have had some success um, because uh, sticking plaster is very similar to the word for, uh, for, for quack in Swedish. So um, sticking plaster or quack is what it's called in Sweden. But it sounds better in Swedish. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I'll talk a little bit about the book. Um, but the subtitle of the book was Alternative Medicine on Trial. Because obviously we were going to put alternative medicine on clinical trial. Um, but it turned out that it was me that was going to be on trial in the end. So. Um, I'll talk about alternative medicine, um, chiropractic in particular, which we criticized in the book, um, the libel case that followed, um, and the general sort of battle for free speech that's been going on in, in Britain. Um, and um, I, I particularly wanted to, I was very grateful for the, the opportunity to, to come to, to Budapest this year because um, a lot of people in the European skeptical movement and the American skeptical movement um, were very supportive of this libel and battle for free speech. So um, it's very nice to be able to come here and tell you the story of what actually happened um, over the last two years. Um, but first of all, I just thought I'd start with um, a bit of background to who I am and what I do. Um, I, I, uh, I, I, as you've heard, I've written about maths and cosmology, and my background is in, in, in physics. Um, and so th what I try to do is to get the public interest in science. Um, I, I used to be less interested in skepticism. I was just more interested in science. I think science is a very positive message, and it's just something that people should be aware of culturally and how it affects their lives. So I would look for any opportunity to get the message of science over to the general public. Um, so for example, um, one of the nice fun things I did uh, about three or four years ago now was I'd just written a book about cosmology. Uh, about the history of the universe, the evolution of the universe, uh, how we know about the Big Bang Theory, the age of the universe, and so on. Um, and, and when you write a book, you become quite obsessed. And I was sat at home one day listening to the radio. Oh, uh, sorry, I've just remembered what my next slide is. I just, I have, just have to apologize. I, I, I came very late yesterday, and I'm going to have to leave very early tomorrow. Um, the reason for my very short visit uh, to Budapest is because I became a father just a few months ago, and so I have to go back and look after my baby. My, thank you very much. Thank you. My, my wife and I argue over whether my baby looks more like me or whether he looks more like her. I, 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 I think he looks more like me. There you can see. Um, but sorry, anyway, cosmology. I, 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 I was obsessed about cosmology, and I was sat at home, and I heard the radio, and there was a song by a very popular English musician, um, although I think her parents are from Ukraine, um, called Katie Mellower. 
And um, she wrote a song called Nine Million Bicycles, a very popular song. And the second verse of the song, which I was listening to on the radio, goes like this. Now, this still makes me very angry um, <laughs> because we are not 12 billion years from the edge. This implies that the age of the universe is 12 billion years old. In fact, the universe is 13.7 billion years old. Um, <laughs> this is not a guess. Scientists, we don't make guesses. <laughs> no one can ever say it's true, but in science we can get closer to the truth. This is the crucial thing. Uh, but I know that I will always be with you, but I, at, this word, at this point, I can't trust a word this woman says. So, um, <laughs> so, um, so I, I, I wrote an article, and the article was only fun. It was just saying, we, you know, we, we're the first generation of humans on this planet to know about the origin of the universe, and we should celebrate this. Uh, but at the end of the article, I rewrote the lyrics. So my version of the lyrics went, we are 13.7 billion light years from the edge of the observable universe. That's a good estimate with well-defined error bars. And with the available information, I predict that I will always be with you. Um, and then, um, so this was printed in the Guardian newspaper. So this was great because the next day, a million people would have read a little bit of cosmology and would have got a little bit of interest in maybe in this subject. Um, but that day, the same day the article was published, I got a phone call from Katie Mellower. Um, and she read the article. She understood it was a joke. Uh, when she was a young girl, she liked astronomy. She was a member of the Astronomy Society in school. And um, we met up the next day, and she re-recorded her song using my lyrics. <laughs> so this is the high point of Mono. You should listen to it first. Here, here we go. We are 13.7 billion light years from the edge of the observable universe. That's a good estimate with well-defined error bars. And with the available information, I predict that I will always be with you. Um. And so, I, I, I mean, I, 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 just a couple of things just got me um, thinking here. One was, um, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed doing this because I know it was picked up in the German newspapers, it was picked up in the Australian newspapers, it was picked up in the Indian newspapers. And, you know, so for, what I do is I try and get the message out there about science. And what took me three hours to write reached lots of people. Um, and this just, just remind me of two things that other people have said. One was the message you've just heard about getting comedians involved, um, getting high-profile people in getting involved, uh, bringing humor to what we say is a very powerful technique. Um, but also from the 1023 campaign that some of you will have heard about yesterday. Uh, uh, if you weren't here yesterday, then, then really do find out about 1023 because it was, it was powerful. It had a, a reach that went beyond Liverpool, it went beyond England. It, it, it was a global uh, uh, stunt, but one that was very effective. So, um, you know, we have a message and we need to understand that message, but we also need to think about clear ways of getting that message out. But um, I think, as I say, 1023 was, was maybe the best example of that that I, I've come across recently. So um, th this is what I normally write about, cosmology. So how did I get interested in, in alternative medicine? There's a big jump from physics to alternative medicine, um, although quantum physics seems to be the very obvious link between the two. Um, but um, the, the reason, the reason um, I got interested was I watched a TV show in England. Uh, and this was the TV show. Uh, it was called Alternative Medicine, The Evidence. And I watched this program because I thought, well, this will be really authoritative because um, this is our best TV channel. For documentaries and for science, BBC Two is the best channel. Um, it was made by the Open University, uh, open.net, the Open University. Again, very respected academic institution. It was presented by Professor Kathy Sykes, who is Professor of Science Communication and Public Understanding of Science 
and who's done some very good work. And it was called The Evidence. The subtitle was The Evidence. So this was going to be about the evidence from an, uh, an objective, authoritative, scientific source. So I watched this program. The first program was about acupuncture. And um, I thought, great, I'll learn a little bit, a bit about acupuncture. At this stage, 2006, I was a little bit interested, but not, not particularly interested. And this is how the first program started. This 21st century surge. Truly remarkable stories of the power of alternative medicine now on BBC Two in a new series. 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 This is the rap version. There we go. All right, let's turn the volume down here. Let's see what happens now. <gasps> Look what it says, pauper inmate. Well, 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 that is exciting. So we've got a jailbird as well as a pauper. I'm beginning to wonder how much uh, further down the social scale my family's gonna tumble. Who do you think you are? Tomorrow at nine on BBC Two. Truly remarkable stories of the power of alternative medicine now on BBC Two. In a new series, Professor Cathy Sykes examines the evidence. In China, a young woman is having open heart surgery. But it's unlike anything you'll see in the West. She's still conscious. Because instead of a general anaesthetic, this 21st century surgical team are using a 2,000-year-old method of controlling pain. Acupuncture. Millions of us now believe that this simple needle has extraordinary powers. Today, more and more of us are putting our faith into alternative medicine. Ginseng, which is the, the, the main herb. From ancient herbal remedies. It's all way beyond what we normally think of as medicine. To miracle faith healing. Said again, healed all! And acupuncture. I'm going to reboot my computer because something odd has happened. Right. There we go. Right. So it's okay. Let me. I'll just reboot it. It'll be fine. Um, um, so what you just saw was a, a, the BBC claimed a woman was having major heart surgery, and what the narrator said was instead of. So I'm going to have to reboot my computer from scratch. It's obviously been very, very disappointing. But um, the, the, the woman said, instead of general anesthetic, this woman is using uh, a centuries, a 2,000-year-old technique for controlling pain, acupuncture. So instead of general anesthetic, she's using acupuncture. That's the clear message that the presenter is giving you. And, um, and I watched that at home, and I thought, wow, that's either the most incredible bit of footage I'm going to see all year, or there's something suspicious happening. And, um, and, and because I'm a freelance journalist, I have some time, um, I thought I'd do some research. So I started digging. I started talking to acupuncturists. I started talking to heart specialists, uh, anesthetists, anybody I could find who, who could give me some insight as to what was going on. And eventually, I got in contact with the Royal College of Anesthetists. 
Um, and they had actually written a report for the BBC on that very, very footage. So I got hold of that report from, from the Royal College of Anaesthetists on that footage. And it said quite clearly that actually the woman did not have general anaesthetic. And she did have acupuncture. But in addition to the acupuncture, the woman had three of the most powerful sedatives known to mankind. So in other words, this woman had so many drugs pumping around her body, it didn't matter she didn't have general anaesthetic. Um, and the acupuncture was purely cosmetic. And so I wrote a letter to the producer. I knew the producers. I knew the people involved. I'd worked at the BBC for six years. Um, so I wrote to them. I said, look, this, this seems a bit suspicious. And they said, look, don't be silly. You know, it's a big program. Yeah, maybe the odd mistake, but this isn't important. So I wrote to their boss. Their boss said the same thing. This is not important. So I wrote to the BBC Complaints Committee. Um, and they rejected my complaint. So I appealed. And they rejected it a second time. Um, eventually, I went to the, the board of trustees of the BBC. They have an ultimate third level of complaint. And after one year, they upheld the complaint. And um, th th I think there were two messages that came out of this for me. One was that it, it really is worth complaining to the media. I've been talking to people here about, in, in Hungary about adverts and certain programs that are unscientific and pseudoscientific. Um, if you see things that are wrong, it really is worth complaining because um, unless we complain, the media will carry on doing this. Um, I mean, people have said to me, well, what was the effect of my complaint? Well, the BBC made a second series about alternative medicine. And the second series was much more scientific, much more fair, much more accurate. Uh, it was also much more boring. But, uh, <laughs> but, but you know, the, tru the, truth, the truth doesn't have to be boring. But in this case, with alternative medicine, it is, it is rather boring. Um, and the second lesson was, if, if you start pursuing something, then just keep going. It's better to pursue one thing doggedly than to have a scattergun approach. And again, I think 1023 said this yesterday. The Merseyside skeptic said, as a small group, do we attack all sorts of different irrationality, or do we have one target for the year? And even in, across the UK, I think what the UK have said, the UK skeptics have said is, OK, if we're going to pick one target, it's going to be homeopathy. And whether that's campaigning about uh, hospitals or 1023 or parliamentary inquiries, you know, that intense pressure, after a while, the public begins to get the message. So um, focusing the attention and, and being determined, I think, are, th are two things that I, I certainly learned from that um, episode. Let me just see if I can resurrect my PowerPoint. Um, Sorry, just bear with me a second. I'll try and be as quick as I can. Uh, lectures. Here we go. So. Great. OK, so hope, hopefully that will be the last of the technical glitches. Um, so um, so I submitted this complaint. I learned about being dogged. Um, I learned about having a, a, a fixed um, project. Um, but, but it also struck me that 2 million people saw this program. And 2 million people would have seen acupuncture and thought, wow, if acupuncture can do this for a woman in Shanghai, what can it do for my backache? What can it do for my migraine? Um, and, and thousands of people the next day may have gone to their high street acupuncturists asking them for help. 
And if the BBC can give misinformation, if advertisers, marketing, the internet, if all these people give false information about alternative medicine, then it's not surprising that the public spend millions and millions of pounds on homeopathy and Reiki and so on. So I thought maybe a good project would be to try and present the public with the truth about these alternative therapies, uh, to show them the scientific evidence, not just against alternative therapies, but also for. If, if, you know, if there is evidence for, then we should talk about that. So I teamed up with um, Professor Edzard Ernst, and we wrote uh, Trick or Treatment. And this is Professor Edzard Ernst. He's the world's first professor of complementary medicine, uh, starting about 17 years ago. There are now many, uh, maybe about 25 professors around the world. But he was the first. And um, we teamed up. It, it, although he is a professor of complementary medicine, he has a very interesting background. Uh, I think he grew up in Munich. He, he studied as a doctor. His first job uh, in, medical, uh, in hospitals was working as a homeopath. The first job he got was in a homeopathic hospital, and he learned about homeopathy. His family had used homeopathy. His family was a, a, a very strong supporter of uh, herbal medicine. So as a young doctor, he was very much influenced by alternative medicine. But then he went off and he started a career in uh, research and rehabilitative medicine in Vienna. And then, as I said, about 17 years ago, he became professor of complementary medicine. And he said, what I'm going to use is do is use all the techniques I learned as a researcher and apply those research techniques to the alternative therapies I used as a young man. So he has a very interesting background, a background in alternative medicine and a background in research. And for the last 17 years, that's what he's done. He has scrutinized alternative therapies. He's looked at other people's research and conducted systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And, um, and he's a tremendous force for good in terms of trying to get people to understand the latest research, the best research on alternative therapies. And we teamed up and we said, we'll write this book and we'll tell people which therapies work, which therapies don't work, which ones are safe, which ones are dangerous. Um, uh, and as you've heard, um, as I've just said, we, we're not negative. We're not entirely negative. Uh, if the evidence is positive, we try and talk about that positive evidence. Um, it's very important to us that uh, for something like irritable bowel syndrome, there's some evidence that um, hypnotherapy is effective. Um, for some heart problems, there's some evidence that the herb hawthorn is effective. For muscular pain, there's some evidence that devil's claw is effective. And we, we say all of this in the book. But in general, I think we, our conclusions are, are, are ob obviously negative, um, as, as you'll know some of the evidence yourself. So we wrote this book, and... Um, and, and it's just come out in Hungary, and this is the Hungarian cover. Um, and when, we, when we published the book, the book was first published two years ago. Um, we want people to know about the book. So we gave interviews, we gave lectures, we wrote articles. And the main themes in the book, which we wrote about, were acupuncture, herbal medicine, homeopathy, and, and the fourth main topic was chiropractic. And this is the topic I'll, I'll now move on to. Um, because it's the topic that caused so much trouble. Um, in case you don't know about chiropractic, chi again, some of these therapies are popular in one country, they're not popular in another country. Homeopathy is massive in India, um, is growing in Britain, not so popular in America. Chiropractic is massive in America, um, growing in England and so on. So these therapies have different uh, global uh, levels of, of, of uh, popularity. But in case you haven't come across chiropractic, what is chiropractic? Um, well, it, it's spinal manipulation. So I wrote an article in The Guardian, as I say, to sort of tie in with the book. And the first thing I explained in The Guardian is that chiropractic is spinal manipulation. Uh, that's what chiropractors do. Um, if you go to a, a Reiki healer, they will move their hands over to you. If you go to a reflexologist, they'll manipulate your feet. If you go to an iridologist, they will look at your eyes. Uh, a, a, a chiropractor will manipulate your spine. That's the key thing that a chiropractor will do. Excuse me. Sorry. Thank you. It's me talking. <laughs> <laughs> so you would think with spinal manipulation, if they manipulate your spine, what will they do? They'll fix a back problem. That seems like common sense. And there is some evidence that they can help with a back problem. Um, 
It's a bit like physiotherapy. You know, it's a bit like massage. And some of these things can relieve back problems. The evidence is weak, but it's, it's, it's positive, slightly positive. And also, we must remember that back problems are very difficult to treat. So chiropractors do as well or as badly as anybody else, really. Um, I talked about the risks, because I, although chiropractors do as well or as badly as anybody else, um, I think they're a bit more dangerous. There are two types of risks that chiropractors have. One is um, a, a common risk of bruising and stiffness and uh, short-term pain. Uh, which is quite common, but something you would live with if, if it helped fix your back. The other type of risk is much rarer, but much more serious. The most, uh, coming the most popular uh, hallmark technique of the chiropractor is manipulating the very top of the spine, the neck. It's a very sharp movement they will make. And you hear a cracking noise sometimes. And the risk with this is that it damages the arteries going to the brain. And this damaging can lead to the development of blood clots, and the development of blood clots can lead to strokes and even death. Um, Edzard, I think, has documented over 700 cases. I need to double check that number. But over 700 cases where people seem to have suffered severe trauma after going to a chiropractor. And um, the risk is very hard to, to, to assess because often people may have a delayed reaction a week, two weeks, months later. Uh, cases may not be documented. The 700 cases Edzard found had not been documented elsewhere. So we don't know how big this risk is. It may be one in a million, it may be one in 10,000. But that is also a worry because we don't know what this risk is. So, so far, no pseudoscience, no, um, no what I would, no, there's nothing here that I would say is relevant to a skeptical audience because. Spinal manipulation, a bit like physiotherapy, helps with the back problem, might have a risk. That's all sort of common sense, all fairly basic, uh, fits in with our understanding of maths and physics and chemistry and biology. But the part of the article that calls the fuss links in with the pseudoscience of, of chiropractic. The third point of the article, I said that what worries me is that half the chiropractors in Britain treat children's conditions that have nothing to do with the back. Things like uh, ear infections and asthma and colic. Now, why should spinal manipulation help a child with an ear infection? Why should spinal manipulation help a, 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 a baby who's a few months old with colic? This makes no scientific sense. Um, and when you look at the evidence, it's just, it's just not there. Um, the, the, so the evidence that has been researched conducted on, on, on some of these conditions. So, for example, there was one trial where they took a, a whole load of babies and they went to see a chiropractor and the babies had colic. And uh, after two months, 93% of those babies recovered from colic. Now, why didn't 100% recover? You know, every baby recovers from colic sooner or later. There was no control. Um, when they did a controlled experiment, uh, I think it was a, a Danish group did a controlled experiment. They put 50 babies with a chiropractor. They gave 50 babies to a nurse. And the nurse just held the baby. And then they gave them back to the parents. The parents obviously didn't know whether they'd seen the chiropractor or the nurse. And the levels of recovery were exactly the same. So for me, there is no good evidence to support these claims. The chiropractors make these claims. I said parents shouldn't go and see these people. Um, I said they didn't have the evidence to back up their claims. Um, now, before I tell you what happened next, let me explain to you why chiropractors would begin to believe these things. Um, the origin of chiropractic goes back 100 years or so to this man here. This is Daniel Palmer. He's the man who invented chiropractic. Um, he was a magnetic healer. He was a spiritual healer. And then he invented chiropractic. The first two people he treated had a heart condition and profound deafness. And he believed, or he claimed, that he treated these people using spinal manipulation. Um, and this is obviously miraculous. And his philosophy was, the, the idea, the underlying mechanism was that the spine carries the nerves, nervous system to large parts of the body. So if there is a blockage in the spine, if there is a misalignment, then this will block the nervous system 
and somewhere in the body will be affected. So if you are sick in a certain part of your body, then manipulate the right bit of the spine, allow the nervous system to flow, and you will heal that part of the body. That was his philosophy. Um, he talked about innate intelligence flowing through the nervous system. Um, he talked about a subluxation. A subluxation is a blockage of the nervous system in the spine. And uh, he believed he could treat anything. Chiropractic was not about treating back problems. It was about treating every other kind of problem by manipulating the back, okay? And that is why when you come to uh, the early 1900s, you see these kind of adverts. Um, chiropractic adjusts the cause of disease. Not back problems, but just disease. Um, if you ha are afflicted in any way, look up the chiropractor. Uh, there, are, there are very few diseases, as they are understood today, which are not treatable by the chiropractic method. Uh, even on the internet, you will find these, gra the, these charts and diagrams. Um, so, you know, if you have a problem with your liver, this is the area you need to manipulate. If you have a problem uh, with your kidney, it's somewhere around here, okay? This is why chiropractors have these odd beliefs. Um, they're a remnant, a leftover from the 19th century. And I should stress, there's a division within the chiropractic community. In Britain, I would say half of the chiropractors think this is ridiculous. But the other half of the chiropractors think, actually, there's something in this. And that is the half of the chiropractors who will treat children. So I wrote this article, and I just thought this was, you know, what, what we do. You know, we, we, we are interested in evidence. We're interested in evidence-based medicine. We're interested in pseudo pseudoscience. We write articles about this, and we tell the general public. But the British Chiropractic Association didn't see it this way. Um, I mentioned the British Chiropractic Association in the article because they promote some of these treatments. And one month after the article was published, um, I was sent a threatening letter, threatening to sue me for libel. And um, the story is very, very long. It went on for two years, this, this libel case. Um, so I will race through it very quickly. What time should I finish? I know... If I, if I finish, say, 10.35? Yeah, okay, and then, and then um, um, okay. So let me race through it very quickly and tell you what happened with this libel case. Um, the article was published in 2008, so we're going back two years now. The BCA threatened me with libel. They sued me personally, not the Guardian. When you sue somebody for libel, so libel is, I mean, it's the English legal term for when you say something bad about somebody else, typically in print. Um, so I libeled them, they said, and they sued me personally. They, ca they could have sued the Guardian. They could have sued the shop that sells the Guardian newspaper. They could have sued lots of people, but they sued me personally. And so I went to see the Guardian newspaper. I said, look, I'm being sued. What, you know, what do I do? You know, what, what, you know, what are we going to do? And the Guardian said, hey, not so quick with the we, <laughs> because you're the guy being sued. Um, and I realized how scared the newspapers are of libel. Um, in England, there are two major problems with the libel law that, that will affect anybody who wants to write about these kind of issues. The first issue is that the law is stacked against you. As a, as a writer, a scientist, a blogger, an academic, an academic journal, a newspaper, the law is against you because you are guilty until you are proven innocent. There is no public interest defense. The other side um, doesn't have to show any damage. It is assumed that they have a wonderful reputation. Everything is stacked against you. And secondly, it's very, very expensive. A libel case can cost easily a million euros. So when somebody threatens to sue you for libel, there is a million euros you could lose, and you know the law is against you. And so the newspaper, The Guardian, said, look, let's just get rid of this. Um, let's, let's give them a clarification. If they think you said something unclear, just clear it up for them. The, 
British Chiropractic Association, I, I call them the BCA, the British Chiropractic Association. The BCA said, we don't want a clarification. The Guardian said, have a right of reply. Have 400 words. If you think you have evidence, write down the evidence. The BCA said no. The Guardian even offered them an apology. And the BCA said, no, we don't want you to apologize. We want Simon to apologize. And I can't apologize for something I know is true. Um, and so um, the Guardian then said, OK, sorry, this is your problem now. And so I was being sued personally, and the Guardian um, stood back. And I don't blame the Guardian, really, because the Guardian said to me, if we lose a million euros, we're going to have to sack three journalists. So how can we sack three journalists over one little article? That's how terrible the libel laws are. They scare newspapers. Uh, ben Goldacre, many of you may have heard Ben Goldacre speak. He wrote an article for The Guardian about three years ago about Matthias Rath, a German uh, vitamin salesman. And Rath was promoting vitamins in South Africa to treat HIV. And Ben Goldacre said, this is ridiculous. Matthias Rath sued The Guardian for libel. Now, The Guardian won that case. But even if you win the case, you lose money. The Guardian lost £175,000, so €220,000, in winning the case. So why would you ever defend your writing if when you win, you lose? So this is the problem. So I, I, um, I found another lawyer. Um, and we said, look, we're going we're gonna to try and defend this. We're going to do our best. Um, after one year, we had a, a judgment uh, from the judge just on the meaning of the article. What does this article mean? Before you go to trial, you must agree what it means. And the judge said I was calling them dishonest. Now, I don't think my article called them dishonest. I, I think my article called them deluded or reckless or, or ignorant of the evidence, I, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but I don't think they're, they're, they're dishonest. But the judge said I was calling them dishonest. So this is very hard to prove. Uh, and so things looked really bad in the spring of 2009. Um, and I think that's when a lot of people heard about the case for the first time. They thought, this is ridiculous. Um, here is somebody who's a science writer pointing out something obvious, and the law is coming down against him. And that's the point when I know a lot of people in Europe uh, contacted me and said, look, how can we support? How can we help? And you began to raise awareness, um, not just about my case, but about English law and how English law is so hostile to free speech. Um, it took another whole year. We appealed that. We kept on saying, we want to appeal this decision. We think it's a wrong decision. And it took another year to get this far. And um, at that point, we had a court of appeal only on the meaning. Again, we're not going to trial yet. This is only the meaning. And we had three of the most powerful judges in the country. We had the Lord Chief Justice, the Master of the Rolls, and Sir Stephen Sedley, the three most powerful judges you could imagine. And thank God they, they agreed with me. They said, OK, this is an argument about evidence. It's an argument about science. It's an ar argument about evidence-based medicine. Simon is offering his opinion, you know, his, his interpretation of the evidence. And therefore, we agree that what Simon says is his meaning is the correct version. And they also made some very powerful statements. They said, England should not become a country like Italy was condemning Galileo. Um, the English justice system shouldn't become an Orwellian ministry of truth. So they were very critical of their own legal structure, uh, which was very encouraging in terms of a later battle that I'll come to in a minute about changing the law. And this judgment was so much in my favor um, that the BCA, the chiropractors, two weeks later dropped the case. And so in the spring of this year, after two years, the case eventually went away. Um, to get to this point um, cost both sides, I think, about half a million euros, which is just a ridiculous amount of money. It's absurd to force so much money and time to sort out something that's so simple. So, but, but some good things came out of this. Some good things came out of it. Let me um, point to some of the good things. Uh, one good thing was that people started talking about chiropractic. 
Before this, people weren't interested in chiropractic. The British Medical Journal ran a two-page debate about the evidence for chiropractic. Edzard Ernst wrote the negative case. The BCA, the chiropractors, wrote the positive case. And the editor of the BMJ acted as referee. And her conclusion was, and readers can decide for themselves whether or not they are convinced, Edzard Ernst is not. His demolition of the 18 references is, to my mind, complete. So this was great. Doctors, GPs, nurses began to read about the evidence. Um, secondly, skeptics became more interested in chiropractic. Um, this is a, a really good article by Chris French that you can look up online in The Guardian. And Chris documented in this article how skeptics, uh, two, I think really two or three skeptics, um, Alan Hennis and Simon Perry in particular, um, said, we're going to complain. This is a, a homeopathy in England is not regulated. I can be a homeopath in England. Um, I could go and treat people, you know, on, on Monday uh, and call myself a homeopath. I couldn't treat animals. If you want to treat animals, you have to be qualified. But if you want to treat humans, any, anybody can do this. Um, but I can't call myself a chiropractor. Chiropractor is a recognized medical title. So they have codes of ethics, codes of conduct, very strict rules. And what Alan Hennis and Simon Perry did was they began to complain about chiropractors who made misleading claims. I think in 2008, the chiropractors received 20 complaints. In 2009, they received 600 in one month. And now, it's, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, they, what they have, what the skeptics have done is put chiropractic under the kind of scrutiny that the chiropractic council should have been doing for 10, 20 years. And their websites have changed. These 600 cases are still being investigated. Um, but it's, it's, what they've done is, a, is of great importance, I think, to, to just um, health in Britain. Um, but the, the, other, the third positive thing is that there's been a campaign for libel reform. Uh, people have realized, because of support from Europe, and particularly, I think, support from America, um, just two months ago, no, I think just last month, in August, uh, President Obama signed a new piece of legislation. And what the American president was saying in that legislation was, the Americans now have no respect for English libel. So if any American citizen is sued in England, that will have no impact because the American law will just ignore it. Because they see that our laws are unfair. And, and you would think, well, how can an American end up being sued in England? Well, this, there is a ph phenomenon known as libel tourism, which means, yeah, no, London is the libel capital of the world. Um, this means that if somebody overseas wants to shut up somebody else overseas, they will sue them in London. So there was an American citizen, um, Rachel Ehrenfeld, who criticized a Saudi billionaire. He sued her in London. Saudi billionaire, American author, American publisher, case ends up in London. Now, how can a case end up in London? You need two things. One, you must have a reputation in London. If you're a billionaire, you have a reputation in London. You have property, you have business partners. So reputation is easy. Two, you must have publication in London. With the internet, anything is available in London. So second tick. And, and this book wasn't on the internet. This book was sold in London, though, via Amazon and so on. And it was the, the book was sold in very large quantities in England. Um, 23 copies. <laughs> That's all. 23 copies, billionaire, you sue in London. We have Danish banks, uh, Icelandic banks, suing Danish newspapers in London. Russian oligarchs suing Russian newspapers in London. Um, there is a, a British uh, sir, a, a cardiac specialist, uh, Peter Wilmshurst, who's being sued right now. He's British, he's being sued in London, okay. But he made his comments in America to an American journalist for an American online magazine at an American conference about an American company but he's sued in London. Because in America, this case would never get off the ground. And that's why I think and we, it's part of the reason we, I, I mean, we're kind of a, a, a very supportive community. 
But I think one of the reasons that there was support from skeptics around the world was that this affects everybody. I gave an interview to an Australian journalist um, in Melbourne about homeopathy. And I said, um, you know, I, I made some criticisms about homeopathy. This was about uh, a year and a half ago. And he couldn't publish the interview. His lawyer said, I can't publish what Simon says because we might end up being sued in London. And instead, the journalist wrote an article about how hard it was being an Australian journalist scared of English libel law. So there has been a campaign. The campaign has been very, um, you know, we've had criticism from the UN Human Rights Committee. Everybody acknowledges that English libel law is bad. Um, this is the cost of libel. In England, that's libel. These three or four spikes here are English libel costs. On average, about a million pounds. This is the cost of a libel case in the rest of Europe. Vanishingly small. You know, the, the damages are only a few thousand pounds. Why should the process be so expensive and scary? Um, but the campaign has made some great progress. Um, oh, sorry, that's my son. <laughs> See, keep libel laws out of science. He's a big supporter. <laughs> He's not our most famous supporter. This is our most famous supporter. Um, People like Richard Dawkins, when he spoke to a party conference last year, uh, Penn and Teller, James Randi, um, over 50,000 people have signed the petition, uh, a Nobel laureate, uh, a chief government science advisor, um, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Fry, medical journals, uh, the Astronomer Royal, the Poet Laureate, um, skeptics and bloggers have been incredibly valuable in spreading the word. Um, and, and what's happened as a result of this is that the politicians have started to listen. Um, in April, before the general election, all three political parties said, we will change the libel law. Um, it was a fantastic achievement. Um, and then the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats formed a coalition, and part of their coalition agreement was to change the libel law. And um, now we're in a position whereby new legislation is being drafted. Um, there will be a new defamation bill, um, a draft bill proposed in January. And, I mean, human rights groups, um, index on censorship, English pen, lots of charities, lots of organizations, journalists and so on have supported this. But I genuinely believe that the skeptic movement has played a massive role in getting the, 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 the parliament, the British parliament, to change its mind. Um, and I'll finish very briefly with this clip, if I can find it. Um, they had a, a, a debate in, uh, actually, maybe I want to do it a different way. What's going to happen here? This is going to be terrible. I'll see what happens with this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Maybe if we take questions now, if I can get this to work. Uh, Finally, oh. can I say that when I hear my noble friend, the minister, Lord McNally, speak as he did just now, I wonder whether I'm alive at all or whether I'm in heaven, because <laughs> I never thought to hear a reply of that kind. Um, what he has said is extremely encouraging because it indicates an open-mindedness to reform, a uh, willingness to get on, a willingness to listen. On that basis, I ask this House to give this bill a second reading. Yeah. Yeah. question is, this bill be now read a second time. As many of that opinion will say content. Yeah. The contrary not content. The content have it. So that Finally, was, uh, can I say that when I hear my noble friend the minister, Lord McNally, speak as he did just now. I want Sorry, he's going to say the same thing again. For some reason, it's a very odd edit. Um, but um, that was the last parliamentary debate on libel reform. And, and who you heard was a chap called Lord Lester, who's been drafting some of the libel reform legislation. And um, there was a big debate, and the, the government minister responsible responded to that debate. And what you heard at the beginning, I should have set it up, uh, Lord Leicester said, I can't believe it seems like I'm in heaven. Um, the government is so positive to libel reform um, that, that um, it really looks like we're going to get somewhere. 
And as you can hear, it was passed through that stage of the parliamentary reform. There is still a long way to go. Um, I'm convinced there will be a, a, a libel reform bill. The question is, will it be radical or will it be watered down? And um, so I know many of you will have signed up to this petition already, uh, but if you haven't signed up, please do. Uh, and if you have signed up, please encourage more people because um, you know, every 10,000 people who sign up remind the government that we haven't forgotten about this and that they have to deliver on that promise. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Okay, as I mentioned that now we have uh, time for questions and then in 10 minutes uh, we'll have a coffee break and then we are in time, but uh, we can be a bit longer if there are many questions. You were the fastest there. Oh, wait. Thanks. Well, it's not about your main message, but in my opinion, you are, uh, your text of the song is not precise enough. No, no, so you're absolutely right. So <laughs> I mean that, in my opinion, it would be something like, we are 13.7 billion light years from the edge of the observable universe in a well-defined sense. Yes, no, you're absolutely right. In you're absolutely sense, right. In another, even better justifiable sense, we are much further away. Yes. Well, yeah. I don't know the actual figure, but... No, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yes. Sorry, next question. <laughs> you said that London is a capital of libel uh, suits. Uh, are there any statistics on it? How many trials are from overseas or, over, or outside the country? It, it's, th there have been statistics that have been developed over the last year or two. Um, I don't know the numbers offhand. The, the problem is that, um, you know, the Peter Wilmshurst case, I'd call that libel tourism. But under the general definition, it's not libel tourism because people say, well, he's British. You know, why shouldn't he be sued in Britain? Um, th there's a case of a, 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 an Israeli technology company suing a Swedish professor of linguistics. But that was published in an English journal. But why not sue in Israel? Why not sue in Sweden? No, they'll always sue in London. Um, and also, the, the bigger, you know, there, there are about, I think about six cases every year go to court. Because it's so expensive, people back down and apologize. So what's very hard to do is to get the number of cases that are settled very early on. Um, so, for example, I was threatened with libel in January. And no, now I, uh, it went away. Because <laughs> by that stage, I'd met some very, very good libel lawyers. And they managed to scare this person away and say, look, for God's sake, don't be ridiculous. You, you know, if you sue Simon, it's going to be big and painful for everybody. Um, but that's not documented anywhere. Um, and so a lot of cases don't get documented. And then a lot of cases are people who self-censor. So newspapers will admit, the editor of the BMJ will say, there's things I'd like to write, but I don't write them because of the fear of libel. Um, I've even heard of editors who say there are journals, there are papers we should withdraw. But I don't want to withdraw the paper because that would insult the author, and then the author could sue me for libel. So it's... it's the, it, it's, the, the cases are absurd. There was an English tennis player, I was talking to somebody yesterday, I was saying that an English tennis player who lost 51 games in a row on the international circuit in straight sets. And one, uh, the BBC called him the worst tennis player in the world. <laughs> you know, on, on that definition, that's a one defi it's a good definition. He is the worst tennis player. He sued them for libel. They said, sorry, here's a check. He sued 10 other newspapers. And they all apologized. Eventually, an 11th newspaper said, OK, take us to court. And the newspaper won. But what's interesting is that the other 10 people also would have won, but they're scared. So people back off when they don't need to. 
Yeah, uh, Pavlíček from Prague. Just a question: Why it's so expensive? I have like uh, since coming from yeah. Prague, where uh, we have also some uh, label uh, label uh, uh, trials. It's not so expensive. I mean, yeah. uh, as long as you defend yourself, etc. Uh, yeah. wh wh where the money actually got lost, and uh, maybe uh, where actually did you get such so much money? I mean, okay. uh, <laughs> some people. Uh, <laughs> I sell vitamin pills. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I, I mean I'm very lucky because I've had four four books translated into 20 languages, and so after 10 years of writing, I, I have a. Enough. I knew I knew I wouldn't be bankrupt. I knew I'd have enough money. My wife is a journalist. She's very supportive. Um, but why is it so expensive? Well, um, all the libel cases have to be heard, heard heard in London. With other crimes and problems, you can ha you know you can go to Manchester or Bristol or Liverpool. But because it's focused in London, you only have the most expensive lawyers who deal with it. Um, it's a high court matter. Um, there's a jury involved. The jury always makes the process much longer. The law is very complicated and technical. So immediately you start off with an expensive base. Then um, you end up with a situation whereby if, if, if a Saudi billionaire comes in and says, I'm going to spend a million pounds, then the price, prices go up even further. And if you're going to defend yourself, you have to, you have to get the best lawyers as well. Um, and a barrister, a libel barrister, will charge 1,400 euros for one hour. Um, and it's ridiculous. And then you can do what's called no win, no fee. So if, you, if, you, if you're the Saudi billionaire and you know you're going to win because the law's in your favor and so on, you, you say to the lawyer, I'll pay you no win, no fee. So if you don't win, you don't get no money, but we know we're going to win. And if you win, you get double the money. But it's the other side that has to pay. So now the cost of the case doubles. And worse still, the Saudi billionaire can say, right, I'm going to take out insurance. I know I'm going to win, but in case I lose, I'm going to take out insurance. And that might cost 250,000 euros. Now the Saudi billionaire will win, so now the other side has to pay the insurance. So suddenly, you know, the money just gets doubled and doubled, and it's, it's just absurd. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be this way. The Times newspaper used to have a very good legal um, uh, a lawyer, and he, he, a French woman felt she'd been accused. And we, and we must have a libel law. I don't want to get rid of libel. We need to keep libel. And the, the French journalist felt she'd been accused of murder. And the article, the, the, the journalist said, no, I, I'm not accusing you of murder. I'm just saying you knew the murderer. And you know, I think it's clear to me. She said it was clear to her. And they were going to go to court. And that would have cost a million pounds. So the Times lawyer said, look, let's agree on another barrister. You, know, you ask your lawyer to find a barrister. I'll, we'll find a barrister that we both agree on, a fair person. We'll get two more people. We'll give them a crate of champagne each. We'll give the lawyer in the middle a thousand pounds for one day's work, um, or you know, or, or one morning's work, and just let them decide the meaning. And whatever they say the meaning is, we'll agree it. And that was it. And the, the meaning agreed with the newspaper, the French journalist dropped the case, and that was the end of it. So it doesn't have to take two years. You can have, I'm not saying you give people bottles of champagne, but you can have a very cheap, informal tribunal that's very rapid and effective. And often, yeah. Yeah, journalists will say, we don't want a perfect libel system. We just want one that's affordable. So that we, if you have a perfect libel system, it's so expensive that nobody can afford to use it. We just need one that, that is more democratic. Gabor Stöcker from Hungarian News Portal Index. You dedicated your book to the Prince of Wales. Why? Uh, so Prince Charles, the book is dedicated to His Royal Highness, the Prince, uh, Prince of Wales, Prince Charles. And it was, the reason was, Prince Charles in England plays a very big role in alternative medicine. Um, he is given speeches to doctors, the World Health Organization. He set up something called the Prince's Foundation for Integrated Health, which is a lobby group. He, he's commissioned reports on alternative medicine. He is the biggest champion. 
the queen uses alternative medicine, um, and, and so on. And when he writes to a minister, or when he writes to a university chancellor, people listen. And we dedicated the book to him because I think in the year 2000, he said, we must do the research. You know, we must look into alternative medicine. We must do the research. So we said, OK, we've done the research. Now here's the book. Read the book. Change your mind. Um, but I don't know if he's read the book, and I know he hasn't changed his mind. So um, yeah. Again. Yeah, I mean, the reason, and the other reason, was to get people aware of the book, to realize there's a link with Prince Charles, and that, you know, to try and get people's interest in what we're writing about. Okay, uh, yeah. it's time for a coffee break. Um, and I would like to mention that, that you can buy uh, Simon's book uh, in Hungary and here, and maybe there are some copies. Yeah, there'll be some English copies English. as well. Um, yes, and uh, maybe you can find Simon to get something. Written into yeah, I'll be here so over the coffee break and yeah. I'll be around over lunch, so, so just grab me any time in the next day. So 15 minutes, please try to be back for the next session.